2019's Death Stranding is a game of many paradoxes. It's a haunting, bizarre, and surreal experience, yet it also somehow manages to be heartfelt and incredibly emotional. It's a celebration of the American mythos, but also a critique of it. It's an ode to connections and to isolation. It's about embracing connections and questioning them. It's about returning to the past, both historically and personally, both inside the story and out, yet also about finding the strength to leave that past behind. Death Stranding's been out now for just over a year, and it's taken about that long for me to even begin, despite several attempts in previous videos, to really wrap my head around it. In this video, I'll be not only reviewing the game, but also returning to some of the points that I made in previous videos to see how well, over a year, my arguments have held up. So, let's begin. Death Stranding is the story of Sam Porter Bridges, played by Norman Reedus, in a version of America that has both literally and figuratively transformed following a mysterious catastrophe known as the Death Stranding. As Sam, players are tasked with building the so-called Chiral Network, a 3D printing, delivery, and information grid by traveling the country and winning over its people, one delivery and connection at a time. Along the way, Sam also begins to piece together what really caused the Death Stranding and what really happened in his traumatic past. His is a journey of self-discovery and adventure, yet also of therapeutic closure if not often one punctuated by the fair nightmare. With Death Stranding, Hideo Kojima continues to develop his emphasis on psychology that traces back all the way to at least 2001's Sons of Liberty, but directly drawing from his most previous title, 2015's MGSV The Phantom Pain, and the cancelled project, Silent Hills, Death Stranding is surreal and often uncanny. It's not for nothing this game quotes from the novelist Kobo Abe and genius 19th century writer William Blake, and name checks artists and thinkers as far afield as Sigmund Freud, Franz Kafka, and filmmaker Lars von Trier. Death Stranding does all of this because it's quasi-surrealist. Want to come work for me? But it's difficult to go into Death Stranding's story or its themes before addressing its detractors. In a previous video, I tried to assuage the game's reputation as a glorified walking simulator by appealing to a genre a mass audience has no problem with accepting and enjoying despite mainly centering, also as Death Stranding does, around one thing, first-person shooters. But with a year more of time with Death Stranding, I think I can tackle this all-too-common critique of it being just a walking simulator in a somewhat different way. The most important thing to say about this game is that Death Stranding is a reinvention of the concept of an open-world sandbox game. People dislike how much Death Stranding revolves around making deliveries over long stretches of terrain, and how little you actually get to see variety in the stuff you're hauling, 
But here are the two things that Death Stranding has going against it. It's subtle, and it's unforgiving. More than unforgiving, Death Stranding is built around fundamentally subverting that most sacred expectation in video games of all, the expectation of an unadulterated escapist power fantasy. So let's try to elaborate here. Famed game designer Will Wright once said, a game should be easy to pick up, but hard to master. That's certainly true about Death Stranding, yet many who dislike it never got past learning through experiencing its fundamentals. Take the most common complaint that I already mentioned, that Death Stranding is a walking sim. My problem with this sentiment is it ignores how fundamentally important everything around the walking is. To me, a walking simulator implies a game with no challenge and no real mechanics or features beyond just moving around and looking at stuff. That doesn't describe Death Stranding in the slightest. Further, some have argued Death Stranding lacks variety, and every area is basically, if you're going to be reductive about it, the same empty vast wasteland. Well, there are a few important things to say on these points. Things, again, that I tried and maybe did not succeed in addressing in prior videos. The basics remain basically the same, but while you play over time, Death Stranding is constantly changing. New regions come with their own unique considerations, while new gear is pretty frequently introduced. It just isn't the case that all deliveries can be completed the same. Many, if not most of them, have their own pitfalls or requirements, and can be completed more than one way. Due to how Death Stranding is designed, you're always at least a little bit dependent on the fabrications of other players, or on ones you've made yourself. And to build more structures, or gain a stronger connection to other players' worlds along the literal multiverse that is the interlinked game world, you have to complete deliveries and raise your porter grade. In other words, and this is key, Death Stranding often is only as big of a pain in the ass or as boring as you've made it. Quite literally here, the future is in your hands. If we think about how the open world sandbox genre has grown over the years, what's the essential tension that's still around? I'd argue the one between design and free play. 2018's Red Dead Redemption 2 was a masterfully crafted, towering piece of interactive entertainment. But what was the result of all those years of development? A game that made a stark separation between times you were free to play how you wanted and times you had to carry out tasks exactly as Rockstar intended. Death Stranding makes no such separation. You are at all times free to approach the game basically however you want which entails you're free to do things the wrong, more time-consuming, or even boring way. Even though, like an older game prior to the open-world, Cambrian-sized evolutionary explosion, every square inch of the map has direct importance to how you'll navigate, despite that, you're still totally free in how you decide to do that navigation. Since at least the mid-2000s, open-world games have tried to foster something called emergent gameplay, meaning developments that result as byproducts of free player agency. 
I still remember playing The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion for the first time. I'd set out to do one task, only to find that first I'd have to do another one, and in turn another one. This gave each task a general greater purpose that made the game feel less like a random line of unrelated activities, and more like it had the structure of a narrative with an overarching beginning, middle, and end. Yet along the way, even in more recent games, almost always in these big open worlds, I'll eventually have traveled to every major area and unlocked fast travel. And then suddenly that open world that seemed so big at the start starts feeling a lot smaller. This brings up another big problem with open world games. The map often becomes irrelevant. Fetch quests, as they're known, are monotonous and annoying because usually you just fast travel from one spot to the next, almost like going right next door. We've got these big sprawling worlds, but once you really get started in the game, they basically become unrelated to how you really play. They look nice, they're good for setting a tone or a setting, but they're barely even there. There's often no greater sense of purpose to them. They have a lifeless, flat, shallow quality because most of the time, apart from exploring them to find new locations or maybe gathering crafting materials, they lack a real gameplay purpose. In this, Death Stranding follows other important titles doing things differently, like No Man's Sky, Minecraft, and Breath of the Wild. You directly interact with the environment in ways that make most other game worlds look and feel like mere movie sets. In Death Stranding, your character really feels the strain of navigation. As a nod to bygone American pastimes like camping in the great outdoors and blazing a pioneer's trail across the vast expanse of untamed American wilderness, Death Stranding tries to bring the scale of its world into a more fully realized tangible state than maybe any game before. And this of course serves as a tragic love letter to everything that the era of the Anthropocene of climate change is destroying. This verges on sim game territory as Death Stranding leaves in everything most other game depictions of another world would leave out. You're given not just the highlights or the movie scene version of events and environments, but rather a fully realized facsimile of them. Like, say, American Truck Simulator, a borderline real geographic terrain, in the sense that going there and getting around takes time, it involves danger, sometimes it involves tedium, and it doesn't always tell you where to go or exactly what to do. But again, unlike something like American Truck Simulator, Death Stranding is designed around more than just isolated traversal. There are a bevy of different registers and features and genre hybrids under the hood here, all providing you with aspects of the stealth, survival horror, and action genres. It's just a matter of taking the initiative and pushing your experience with the game beyond the bare minimum. Experimentation is crucial here. And just like back in Metal Gear, the more you uncover about the game's underlying mechanics and systems, the better prepared you'll be for playing long term. I'll give an example of how the game can adapt to your playstyle and decisions almost like an RPG over time. I came into this area near the end of the game and I decided to build a new safe house here but the proximity of separatists really necessitated building more stuff to rapidly get around them. And that meant doing jobs for the local prepper, the Evo Devo biologist. But once I used up most of her materials, I had to build a route to move more easily between her and the nearest nearby prepper, the paleontologist. Gradually, I began to spread my network of fabrications across the entire area, creating rapid transit zipline routes. I used my new safe house as a kind of forward operating base to conduct occasional raids on the separatist camp, 
but this was only as the long-term result of my initial Oregon Trail-style sojourn through the wilds, encumbered by a huge stockpile of the materials I needed to build the safe house in tow. All these events and activities were completely emergent. Nobody told me, in other words, I had to do them. I took the initiative and the game intuitively reacted, causing me to react in turn, and on and on. It's the kind of game design that open world titles have been trying to achieve for years, going back at least to the halcyon days of Elder Scrolls IV. But for me, not until Death Stranding did this sandbox emergent open world concept feel so satisfactorily realized. All that being said, in interviews like this one with the New York Times, Kojima has admitted the obscurity and the slow burn effect of the game was intentional, primarily as a means of anticipating, preempting, and subverting the inevitable social media response. Quote, Kojima was clearly worried about how Death Stranding would be received online. It's not really easy to swallow, he said, but this was just as he intended. I want people to feel, what the hell is this? He suggested that the immediacy of social media exerts a kind of conservatism on popular taste. Recently, there's social media, and people will kind of start a negative campaign, he said. They might say, I don't really understand it, I'm just stuck, so forget it. End quote. It seems that Death Stranding isn't a game built for headlines or elevator pitches or immediate satisfaction because it's not trying to forge a quick connection, but an intimate lasting bond. That kind of thing takes faith, commitment, and a willingness over time to get out of your comfort zone, not unlike what Kojima has compared the experience to in a different interview, climbing Mount Fuji to watch the sunrise. If we think of chess, technically you might be able to win every match recycling the same tired strategies over and over. But it would be categorically false to stop there, to just say chess is monotonous or that it lacks any complexity. The reason I think people say this about Death Stranding is that its orders often have pretty low bars for completion which might strike you as ironic, given how unforgiving the game can actually be when it comes to simply moving around the world. But what many miss here is the way your stats and porter grade get shaped by your cumulative approach to play. People criticize Death Stranding as though it remains a static experience. The game is constantly changing as you progress and develop into your own personal version of Sam. Maybe another strike against it is that many of the things that it does, Death Stranding does in secret, behind the scenes. A design conceit, of course, that goes back for Kojima to at least MGS4. The secretive dynamic aspect to how Death Stranding changes over time was something I didn't fully grasp until my third playthrough. For example, I noticed that it wasn't until I started actively picking up and delivering other players' cargo that I started to see more of their cargo appearing in my world. And because I was trying to just stick to the main story, I was unable to get many of the upgrades and weapons and items that I normally would have gotten by completing uh, routine deliveries, and this made the game significantly more challenging. I also noticed that the way Sam simply handled the terrain, moved, and how quickly he got tired was all very different depending on how I was approaching the game and completing deliveries. Death Stranding asks the player to rethink the standard approach to objectives in games. 
even Kojima's old games. In MGS, how well and fast that you would sneak non-lethally without accruing much damage determined your in-game rank, which then would unlock various post-game special items. But in Death Stranding, not all S-rank completed deliveries are alike. So if you're complaining that you were able to get one without changing up your strategy or having to put in much effort, that doesn't mean that's the only way to get that S rank. It's up to you to decide what you care about in this game, what you want to do and how you want to approach a given assignment. It's no longer a case of just pass fail, of meeting a given challenge or not. How you meet that challenge, the last one and the next one, it all matters in ways that have never really mattered in games before. Everything about how you have to plan out your deliveries is part of Death Stranding's ethic of preparing for the future. That you don't get to see or enjoy the thing you're delivering yourself seems to be a metaphor for building a future that we won't see achieved in our own lifetimes. The focus isn't on ourselves as individuals, but on others who will outlive us or maybe have not yet even been born. In this pizza delivery, for example, the pizza has to remain flat at all times. But because my route goes over a huge mountain range, some of the stuff I bring, like ladders and so on, I'll need to use along the way. And that means I'll also deliberately have to bring stuff I won't use to make sure no matter what the pizza will stay upright. But to maneuver properly, I'll have to wear the all-terrain skeleton, not the other one that lets me carry a ton of cargo. Do I bring extra batteries to power my thermal pads so my stamina doesn't disappear on the frigid mountain? Or a stabilizer for those sharp mountain inclines? It's always a give and a take, a balancing act between structure and chaos. It's here where all the complex variety the game has to offer starts to fully manifest. Sure, you could just immediately start the order, improvise the best you can along the way, drop the cargo a few times, and still wind up with an S rank, provided that you completed it in a relatively quick pace. But what if you decide independently that you want to focus on your speed rank? Well, that would require prep work before you'd even begin, so that you would already have a quick route set up. Maybe you'd plant a vehicle at a certain crucial location, or wipe out all the local mules or terrorists first. But doing this with a lethal weapon would mean that you would have some bodies you'd need to come back and dispose of before they went necro and became BTs. Maybe you'd build a bridge or a generator somewhere that you figured out you would need in a hurry during the mission. This of course will all be a totally different process if you were focusing instead, say, solely on cargo condition or delivery volume and so on. There may be no wrong way to finish a job, but that isn't the same as saying there's only one way that you really need. Different Porter titles convey different rewards, and these too change your experience over time. There are so many reactive mechanics under the hood here, it sort of makes sense why many people have missed them, and why they assume, after playing the game for an hour or two, that the rest of it's just going to be more of the same. And then of course there will always be the less creative among us who will just stubbornly stick to the same strategies simply because they can. But those other strategies, those other details, and those subtle, hidden, reactive mechanics are there, whether a mass audience has realized this or not. And they're as subtle as the game's nuanced controls. And that brings me to the idea I mentioned earlier about Death Stranding subverting the power fantasy. Though Sam is in many ways a one-man army, the way that control mechanics interact with wider systems in Death Stranding is designed precisely not to make you feel like some unstoppable badass. Though gamers rarely say it out loud, often games are how they cling to an idealized sense of self. Death Stranding doesn't let you be the hero in this conventional sense. Even if Sam winds up more important than we first realize story-wise, there's a very deliberately designed sense in which everything important in Death Stranding 
feels like it's happening off screen to someone and somewhere else. Your job as a porter, after all, is just of logistics. You merely get the important thing where it needs to go, behind the scenes, not unlike the game's many underrated and undervalued secret mechanics. But when you think about it, it's people behind the scenes like Sam, people like nurses, delivery men, game programmers, migrant workers, and dare I say, content creators, whose unappreciated labor outside our awareness is actually making our modern world go round. Death Stranding is a subversion of the power fantasy concept as an ideal of the lone individual who needs no one and nothing but themselves. It's a celebration of selflessness, of the unsung hero. Its design conceit is an expression of our actual cold and indifferent world, which unlike in most video games, none of us can survive in for long alone. The idea, I think, is that over time, as Sam, you start to realize this concept, start to see the value of selflessness, and so to start to no longer think of cargo as merely something for someone else's benefit alone. I've gotten to the point where I'm careful with certain fragile deliveries, not just out of concern for the end score, but for what I know it means to the person waiting for it. Death Stranding is a system for societal sanity, if you will. It's designed around teaching players a kind of remedial class on everything that most games typically leave out when it comes to what can only be called the social contract, our obligation to others. Frankly, society as of late seems to be coming apart. You don't need me to tell you that. And that may be because individuals have lost a sense of trust or of importance in their wider society. And even in turn, trust in each other. Instead of asking what's in it for me in the short term, Death Stranding is about reprogramming your mind to realize what benefits me in the short term at your expense may in fact benefit you in the long term. Maybe you and I are not as discreet as individuals as we first may think. Maybe we are, for better or worse, in this together. This is the problem known in biology as that of altruism. When an organism does something to the benefit of another organism with no apparent benefit or even to the detriment of itself. Altruism is something that Kojima has been talking about through both game design and storytelling going all the way back to MGS1. Death Stranding is fundamentally about altruism. It's a gamified form of it. And that is why, by being so initially unforgiving and unwieldy, it may have turned off so many. It remains an open question, after all, whether altruism is really fundamentally part of human nature. I'm not trying to say by sticking with the game that I or anyone else is somehow morally superior or more naturally altruistic. To the contrary, what I'm saying is on the short term level, the game is intentionally unpleasant. Purely because of the results long term. When you start to approach how you play not only this game, but your own life in a different, more selfless and altruistic way. In some ways, acclimating to Death Stranding can feel like learning to live on another planet or in another life. At first, we can all but barely crawl. And like some foreign language, nothing, either narratively or mechanically, at first makes much sense. But over time, that becomes fundamental to Death Stranding's appeal. This is what makes it such a difficult game to defend or really talk about. Its alienness, if you stick with it, makes you take playing the game seriously. Because it's so different, even idiosyncratic, you have no choice but abide by its strange laws. And once you get a taste for it, much like Sam with his cryptobiotes, which he goes from loathing to actually rather craving, you start to really get a taste for Death Stranding. 
The more I familiarized myself with the game, both mechanically and narratively, the more what at first seemed like vastly empty expanses came to life. The world of Death Stranding is some haunted, enchanted land of the dead. It's here where escapism returns, as after all, it's a necessary component, at least on some level, to any game. That's yet another curious dichotomy. Though thoroughly sci-fi, Death Stranding often is so bizarre and otherworldly it becomes something closer to fantasy. But even if Death Stranding sometimes feels like a dream or even a nightmare, the dangers that it's built around addressing are very real. Altruism isn't in a vacuum after all. We are now living in the wake of the collapse of the naive techno-utopian ideal of social media as a system for societal good that can run itself, simply by empowering and emphasizing the almighty individual. Death Stranding proves with its own so-called social strand system, a better, more altruistic and ethical form of social media is possible. Though your individual contribution of, say, a generator or bridge nets you likes and name recognition, every player is united in Death Stranding behind a single goal, making this alien and hospitable world a little more habitable, one fabrication and act of altruism at a time. Playing as Sam gives you a sense of blazing a trail for others to follow. The game's about building a future, even if it is atop yesterday's ruins, and that's cleverly conveyed via the social strand system. There's nothing like returning to an old bridge that you built, only to find that it's garnered countless likes and updates from other Sams. The sense of pride, tempered by selflessness and altruism, is a delicate balance to strike, and Death Stranding strikes it grandly. Part of its charm as an open world is precisely all the hidden mechanics, items, and locations that you'll still be finding over a hundred hours in. This could come in the form of a secluded hot spring, a remote prepper station, or just reading on the loading screen that, for example, in the very rare event a BT comes into contact with a non-repatriate like Sam, which I'll explain in a second, you'll have to rewind time in one of countless little references the game makes to Life is Strange. To do so, Sam must follow a golden thread within the mysterious world that you enter upon dying, the seam. Being a repatriate means Sam can come back from the dead, and he does so through the seam. This has something to do not only with events in his past, but to ancient Egyptian mythology. Death Stranding is deeply invested in the long forgotten past. From Egypt to even Neanderthals and the death of the dinosaurs, the specialists at Bridges, the game's equivalent of the US government, are obsessed with solving the mystery of the Death Stranding by finding evidence of it in the ancient past. This was part of why, in a previous video, I compared Bridges unfavorably to the Third Reich. Only Nazi Germany, to my mind, really compares to this bizarre, almost worship of a past that's so far gone, it could be used to mean or justify basically anything in the present. There are other Nazi parallels and imagery as well, but a more important focus for Death Stranding I probably neglected to contextualize properly in that video is, of course, on America. What is America at the end of the day? This is the central question for Death Stranding, I suppose. It's not a race, and it's not even necessarily a nation in terms of geography. America, at least for Death Stranding, is a network of common bonds. And because of this, they are subject to constant life, death, rebirth, and reinvention. America may have originated as a lie, Death Stranding tells us, but that doesn't mean we should abandon all it stands for, or reconnect its dots on our own terms. I initially wondered if the game was channeling the ghost of Nazi Germany as some kind of cryptic comment on the resurgence in recent years of crypto-fascism and know-nothing xenophobic nationalism in America. One reason for this was how much people throughout it, as is Kojima's trademark, lie to you. On the surface, it's about one thing, reconnecting America and solving the Death Stranding, while by the end we're very nearly conned into doing more or less the opposite. 
There are also the many, many references to things like climate change, MAGA, Obama, Hillary, America First, and the infamous beautiful border wall, nestled right alongside the Great Depression era Dust Bowl imagery. The hobo codes on the prepper walls, the odes to ancient Egypt that I mentioned earlier, which by the way the Nazis also loved, and the concentration camp-like incinerators, as well as the general sense that we're working for basically a death-worshipping cult. But I was wrong to overstate the Nazi connections. I still argue that they're there, but not to reduce modern America via ad Hitlerian fallacy. America was the nation that came together, after all, and beat the Nazis, due in large part, it has to be mentioned here, to its superior logistics infrastructure. That may have been our single greatest achievement, that and full mobilization, both of which were necessary to winning the war. We're the nation that not only beat Hitler and totalitarian Japan, but ended the singularly worst form of slavery in all of history. Yet the Nazis modeled many of their racial hygiene and eugenics laws after ours, and were also the very nation that, after all, created that unique form of slavery in the first place. So in some sense, America is a land of contradictions. I think how Death Stranding comments on these apparently contradictory aspects is also how it resolves the contradictions narratively and mechanically within itself. Good and evil, progress and decay, even life and death, for Death Stranding none of them are totally divisible. They are bound together, not unlike chiral pairs. Showcasing this underlying connectivity may be why, if they exist, the Nazi references are there. We can't rise above such things as extremist nationalism and racism without first confronting that they're already part of us part of our makeup, part of what, if we aren't careful, we could someday become. And perhaps the only way to prevent that is to come together, to work together, altruistically, as we do in Death Stranding. But the working together doesn't end at building structures. You can entrust cargo to someone else, recover cargo that drops into your world if they lose it, request repairs or deliveries, and more. You can form specific, literal social contracts, bringing the worlds of you and the other person closer together, making their fabrications and dropped cargo and signs easier to see, more likely to appear. Yet there's no messaging system, no player chat. Death Stranding may be the first game to fully gamify the quintessential modern statement that we are alone together. It's this dynamic between isolation and connection, as well as the aforementioned dynamics between good and evil, the present and the past, and so on, upon which everything about Death Stranding as a so-called strand game relies. Even NPCs have to be relied on for greater chiral bandwidth and more materials if you plan on building more than just a few fabrications. Death Stranding is all about making you realize how much of your life is only possible thanks to the anonymous, kindness of strangers. As one example, during boss fights, crying out will summon the proxies of other players who've been through the same ordeal, who will throw you items and weapons that you may suddenly find yourself desperately needing. Ultimately, all of these features are there, I think, to present the player with the question, what kind of society do we, for ourselves, for others, and for the unborn, for America, but also the world that America has built, want? One prevailing view in recent times that I alluded to a moment ago is a version of rugged American individualism, of trusting no one, of voting only for politicians who say they have your back and no one else's, of defining America in nationalistic and very limited terms, of regarding the very concept of an American government, ironically, also with deep suspicion. This view wants walls, not bridges. It is, at best, a version of one of the chiral strands, if you will, that gave rise to American democracy, that of Thomas Hobbes. It is the view, fitting given all the whales we see in the game, of the Leviathan. Death Stranding wants to challenge that view, which posits human nature is inherently bad, and the only role of the government is to simply save us from the lawless wilderness within ourselves. 
that Stranding seems to take the other chiral philosophy behind America, that of John Locke, and his idea of the social contract, which I mentioned before. Rather than merely existing just to keep us apart and pacified under the iron authority of the state, as Hobbes believed it was, for Locke the purpose of the government is founded upon a relationship between the civilian and the wider society, and this relationship is one of give and take. It is this value of compromise, reconciliation, and belief in a future worth building that Death Stranding works so hard to convey. Even though connections along the chiral network in the game seem to cause chiral pollution, not unlike how the rise of a more connected real world has fostered everything from climate change to diseases like not Bola, but Ebola, and of course COVID. Yet I don't think Death Stranding, by acknowledging these things, winds up going back on its initial declaration of a belief in the power of bridges and roads, instead of walls. Why? Because together we can do things like beating the Nazis. We can go from building train lines to superhighways, and in turn from superhighways to renewable energy terminals. Together, America can and has, and I hope will someday again go anywhere we want. Even the moon. And even if connecting together doesn't automatically result in something good, even if it can also sometimes characterize such evil regimes as the Nazis who believed in uniting greater Germany under the so-called Aryan race, even if it has on occasion triggered things like climate change, brought to power demagogues, and harmed the autonomy of the individual, we still have to find a way to come together altruistically, to learn from the past instead of just endlessly repeating those mistakes. The game also deals indirectly with the crucial importance of confronting climate change and widespread isolationism in the near future, which are actually subjects that are more connected than it first might seem. As one song's title from the soundtrack says, point blank, alone we have no future. Death Stranding wants for us, instead of asking what, say, fighting climate change, modifying our lifestyles, and being considerate of others will do for me right here and now, to realize that quite literally the future is in our hands. Even before we can see it, a future, any future, is a sound that can be heard well on its way home. For so long, the very idea of a future, though, in the modern age, has all but lost meaning. The social media era often feels just like an endless, eternal present. But whether we realize it or not, to paraphrase a famous saying from NASA in my hometown of Houston, Texas, suddenly tomorrow came, and it will come again. The best way to think about the coming of that tomorrow in terms of Death Stranding is as a Christmas present. For such a weird and often horrifying and surreal game, Death Stranding is really about the spirit of gift giving, which is why I thought it would make the perfect video for the holidays. Only a monster or an irresponsible person would allow a gift in their name to be given that wasn't meant to bring the recipient joy and make their life more worth living. It won't be easy. The path is full of obstacles, admittedly, and humanity never really evolved the right stuff to live together forever in perfect harmony. But we have to accept that things have changed and need to change still. As I tried but maybe failed to convey in a previous video, clinging to a past that may have never really existed the way we think of it will at best result in repeating the same stupid mistakes as yesterday and at worst transform our visages into that of monsters, mask wearers, and extremists. A phantom of yesterday is no real replacement for a genuine sense of hope or involvement in tomorrow. I'll close with this. At bottom, from physics to chemistry to even human relationships and politics, life is about striking some kind of balance. We have obligations to our fellow man and woman. Burdens we have to, we're ethically and morally bound to, shoulder. So on this holiday season, to end the worst, most chaotic and catastrophic year in living human memory, let's follow Death Stranding's example. Let's begin a new year by getting started on our job. To deliver unto the hands, eyes, and even ears of tomorrow a future they, as part and parcel of ourselves, would like to, or at the very least can, live within. 
Until next time, boss. Merry Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Ho, ho, ho.